Yes, hello and welcome. Welcome, and if you notice, the surroundings are a little bit different. Today, I am broadcasting to you brightly from my home uh, with my two assistants uh, in the back, Senor and Senora Horton. Uh, but yes, uh, it's time to get started. I'm, I wasn't uh, in school today, and um, today we are going to continue on with our discussion of Europe during the Renaissance. And so let me, uh, I'm sorry I can't pull up my notes so you can basically look at them, but if you would, um, pull up the notes that you have, as I would. And we, you should be looking at Roman numeral 18, XVIII, uh, which I've talked about briefly, what would be yesterday. Oh, yes, today is September the 9th. Today is Wednesday of 2020. Uh, if you read through the uh, uh, little uh, blurb that I put in the assignment page, you know, I'm thinking of having your first test on Monday. Uh, so, um, yes, Monday, uh, and it'll be on Canvas, and you'll be given from 7.40 in the morning to 11.59 that night to get the test in. It is a time test, and it will time out at 50 minutes. Okay, so once you begin, you will have 50 minutes to uh, begin. So... Uh, let's begin with Roman numeral 13. Uh, in the first half of the 14th century, Europe had continued to decline. That means during 1300-1350. Europe had continued to decline into a hodgepodge network of warring feudalistic states with no strong national governments emerging. We are still in... Um, basically the age of faith here. The strongest political and economic entity in Western Europe was still the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, however, that begins to change right around 1350. In the second half of that same century, however, England and France and Spain. And there'll be a question that reflects that on your test. England and France and Spain uh, began to establish national identities and they were able to extend power and influence into expanding borders. They, what does that mean? They were able to throw their weight around. They were able to tell other people what to do. Uh, and they were able to expand their own empires. These were called the new monarchies. Central, Southern, and Eastern Europe remained weak, disunited, and still lived under the threat of invasion, particularly from the Ottoman Empire. Roman numeral 19. In France, the cessation, that means the end, of the Hundred Years' War, and I think I talked a little bit about this yesterday, the Hundred Years' War was a war between France and Spain, whereby uh, somewhere in the middle part of the 14th century, the French king died with no male heir. And by the way, keep that in mind, that no male heir thing is going to crop up more than one time over the course of the next few hundred years as a problem, as a situation, uh, and a cause of conflict. And so anyway, um, king, the French king died, no male heir, and the English king, who claimed uh, descendancy from one guy named William the Conqueror, and William the Conqueror, you say, who was he? William the Conqueror is the guy, also called William the Bastard, um, who crossed the English Channel in the year 1066, which was the last time England was successfully invaded and conquered. Not the last time it was attempted, but the last time it was successfully done. And so the current king of England said, hey, I'm a uh, descendant from that French guy. Therefore, since the French king has died, am I not a, an heir to that throne? And so the English king launched an invasion of France for the purpose of 
making England and France one country. Um, there's nothing like greed, is there not? And this was called the Hundred Years War. Why? Because off and on, it lasted from about 1350 to 1453. Um, in the year 1453, England, who had conquered a lot of France at one point in time, held only the port city of Calais. So anyway, um, Charles, the King of France, Charles VI, seventh, was crowned King of France at the conclusion of the Hundred Years' War. And I did mention a lot of things came out of the Hundred Years' War. Uh, for example, France emerged stronger, more unified uh, as a country. Also, um, the French, and I've mentioned this before, the French patron saint, patron saint of France, and all European countries have patron saints. Uh, France has Joan of Arc, uh, the maid of Orléans. She's also called a woman who, uh, the maid who was spoken to by God. And God told her, you know, France is really losing this 100 years war. It need, I choose you to lead them to victory. And she is able to go convince this guy, Charles the uh, Seventh. Uh, that uh, maybe it wasn't Charles VII, but one of the French kings that, you know, uh, if you let me take your army, you know, I'll be able to defeat the English. He did. And you know what? She actually was quite successful. But if you are Machiavellian, and by the way, I was just thinking of Machiavelli the other day. Um, if you don't understand what Machiavelli was about, and don't go home and say, Mom, we have to go watch Game of Thrones. But if you are familiar with Game of Thrones, every powerful figure, just about every figure in that film is Machiavelli. Good and evil do not exist. What exists is power and the ability to stay alive. And if you understand the things that they did, if you understand that, then you have a pretty good grip on Machiavelli because all their moves are Machiavellian. Every one of them. The ones you like is one of the ones you dislike. And no, don't say, Mom, Mr. Horton said we have to watch Game of Thrones. I did not say that. In fact, don't, yeah. If your parents, yeah, it's, uh, it's graphic and violence and also sex. So, no. Uh, anyway. Uh, so Charles had raised an army using the tally as a source of revenue. The tally is one of the names of many such taxes that you're going to find out. Tally is a French tax. Uh, tally is, refers to, it's a head tax. If you have a head, you get taxed. So Charles also won the right to continue to levy this tax on a yearly basis without the permission of any parliamentary body, such as the three estates. What are the three estates? Um, this is a term that you better learn because, uh, yeah, we are going to um, go use the term the three estates a lot because uh, after Rome frittered away during the Dark Ages, during the Medieval Ages, European society was divided into three social classes. or three estates. Uh, and these estates were, these classes were rigid social classes. If you were born into one of the three estates, um, you were probably never going to get out of it. Uh, there was practically no way out of it. it was, actually, there was one way out of it. If you were born into the third estate, uh, there, it, theoretically, you could get out of the third estate um, by becoming a priest which would catapult you into the first estate. But let's name them first. Okay, the three estates. And they are in this order. One, first estate, uh, the priest, priesthood. Uh, better, just call it the clergy, C-L-E-R-G-Y. Uh, yeah, that's the first estate. And um, they are over the other two, although the nobility 
which is the second estate. And by the way, clergy made up between one and one and a half percent of the population of Europe, uh, depending on where you lived. And by the way, like I said, um, back then people were lining up to be priests. They were turning people away to be priests. Why? Because, well, if you're a priest, you're in the first estate, you have rank, you have privilege, uh, you have three square meals a day and a, a warm place to sleep, and you probably have access to money, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, so many people lined up for that. Today, obviously, that's not the case. Now, the second estate was the nobility. The nobility, the nobility were the descendants of the old warlords who had invaded the Roman Empire, who had fought to uh, protect their lands, who had fought to, you know, only members of the nobility could be knights. Uh, that didn't say they couldn't be soldiers, but they could only could be knights and have titles. Uh, and normally they had, nobles had some kind of a fief, meaning property, uh, and they demanded respect. And uh, for most of their lives, they did nothing. Especially when things settled down in Europe, when the, Bar when the Magyars from the east and the Arabs from the south and the Vikings from the north pretty much quit invading. And the advent of national governments made uh, feudal warlords fighting each other kind of a thing of the past nobility descended into kind of a uselessness, not did any, didn't do anything. And then finally, part C, uh, uh, the third estate. Third estate is basically everybody else. So clergy makes up about one and a half percent. Nobility makes up one and a half to maybe two percent. And everybody else is the third estate. But now the third estate there were two types. And I think I've mentioned this before. It seems like it. There were two types of people in the third estate. One, there were serfs, S-E-R-F-S. -E Let's go surfing now. No, not quite. Serfs were property. Uh, <coughs> were they slaves? Well, yeah. Yes. Uh, outright slaves. Uh, they could make some personal decisions on their own, such as whether to or not to get married. Uh, or at, I'm sorry, not whether to get married, but um, who to marry. But serfs, by the way, there was a written rule, serfs could only marry a per person who lived inside their own, the Lord's domain. They couldn't marry someone outside because then the children of that union who are also property and do work, that'd be unclear as to where they belong. Um, but serfs uh, lived on the estate. They worked for the Lord primarily. Um, and they, yes, they got to grow their own little crops in the work, the work, the worst properties, you know, in a fief, in a manner, the Lord's lands were always the best lands. He had the best source of the water. He had the best grasslands. He had the flattest fields to farm. And the Lord's lands were the best lands. The serfs who lived on the state, the estates, uh, they were given plots to farm, but it was normally where it was rocky and craggy and uh, the farming wasn't as good. And, oh, yeah, they, um, they could not hunt or fish on the Lord's land. That was oftentimes a capital crime. Uh, oh, yes. And they had to dedicate every week a certain amount of labor from three to four days. That means three to four out of six days. The seventh day was the Sabbath uh, to the Lord. Now, the other kind of person in third, third state were peasants. Peasants, uh, they were technically called freeman peasants. Uh, they were um, uh, free to go if they so wanted. 
problem was, where do you go? You know, one thing about being a peasant and living on the Lord's land is the Lord does provide you with some protection. You can take refuge in his castle if there's a besieging army or, you know, or some catastrophe like that. Um, but you have to pay for it. Uh, you have to pay rent. And you, too, can't basically have to live like the serfs do. You live uh, in the rocky hollows of the Lord's estate. You don't have access to water, and you better not be caught hunting, hunting or fishing. Uh, and oftentimes the rents were paid in crops, uh, produce. Um, yeah. Now, both peasants and certain, uh, once again, peasants were free to go. And many peasants, as towns and cities began to evolve in Europe, many peasants did book, did leave to go to the cities to find better opportunities for employment. So did serfs. Now, serfs had to run away, uh, had to slip out. They couldn't leave without the master's permission, and the master wasn't about giving serfs permission to leave. Okay. Part B. Louis XI, French king, also called Louis the Spider, or Charles the Spider, where they get these names, I have no idea, uh, was threatened by his own nobility, particularly Charles the Bold, the king of Bur the Duke of Burgundy. Burgundy is a region, it's in eastern France. It is called Burgundy because in this region there is a flax that produces a rich red dye called Burgundy. Wow. But anyway, uh, so Charles tried to create his own country, and you have the map on page 338. We went over this. I know we did. I showed you the low countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands. Um, so uh, Charles was killed fighting the Swiss in 1477, opening the door for Louis XI to consolidate most of what is now considered France. After the Hundred Years' War, uh, England descended into its own civil war and a new monarchy was elected. This, uh, I mean, see, so the Hundred Years' War had not went well for the, uh, went for the, well for the English and there began a civil war, as it says there, after the English were kicked out of France in 1453. A civil war ensued between the House of Lancaster, uh, which was a, uh, their symbol was the red rose and the house of York, which was a symbol of the white rose. This has been called, wait for it, the War of the Roses. In 1485, the last Yorkist king, Richard III, who, if you are into Shakespeare, Richard III is one of uh, Shakespeare's tragedies. My hearth, my hearth, my, ki my kingdom for a hearth, and I'm saying it like that because Richard III, uh, in reality, um, had a hunchback. I mean, he really looked like Quasimodo. He had a you know, bump on his back, and he walked with a limp, and he uh, had a lisp. Uh, you know, uh, but yeah, um, had a speech impediment. Uh, um, but yes, uh, uh, he is the person. He is surrounded by the... Uh, Henry Tudor's forces, and he would give his whole kingdom for a horse so he could get, get out of there. But anyway, um, so in 1485, the last Yorkist king, Richard III, was defeated by Henry Tudor of the House of Lancaster, the House of the Red Rose. Henry Tudor. Henry Tudor, Henry, who will become known as King Henry the Seventh. Of England, yeah. Of uh, the House of Lancaster, this is the beginning of the Tudor dynasty. It really is a good thing to kind of have a grip on dynasties, particularly in England. Who was in the Tudor dynasty? Well, let's see. That was Henry VII, Henry VIII, uh, Mary I, also called Bloody Mary, followed by Elizabeth I, you remember her, and that was it, which will then take us to the Stuarts, but we'll talk about them later. 
So what do you say? He said Henry the Seventh, who died, Henry the Eighth, who eventually died, his first daughter by his first marriage, Mary the First, and then Elizabeth the First. Actually, squeeze in there somewhere, uh, yeah, between the death of Henry the Eighth and uh, Mary the First, Lady Jane Grey, whom. We are be asked a question about her. No, it's just it's trivial information. She was only monarch. Uh, she was 12, 13 years old, her and her old boyfriend uh, for 22 days. After which she was beheaded. They were so nice. Uh, anyway, yes, that was the beginning of the Tudor dynasty. Henry revoked. One of the things that Henry VII did was to revoke the nobles' right of livery and maintenance. You say, what does that mean? the right for these nobles to maintain their own personal armies. Because if you're a king, you want to hold, rule the whole country, having a bunch of nobles who have their own armies, that can be a pain. He also utilized something called a star chamber, which I've seen on somebody's test. I can't remember which one. What's the star chamber? The star chamber was a room deep within the recesses of certain castles. And um, what happened was people who oppose the king would there'd be a knock on the door in the middle of the night and they would be dragged off to the star chamber. It was a torture chamber. And most trips to the star chamber were one way. Um, it's worth mentioning, it's not just uh, trivial knowledge, uh, it's worth mentioning because one of the first uh, and most important acts of English legal history, which later becomes American legal history, comes in the English Bill of Rights and it, and it's called the right of habeas corpus. Uh, habeas corpus, perhaps H-A-B-E-U-S, habeas, comes from the Latin to have, corpus, C-O-R-P-U-S, which also comes from Latin, which means body. You know, corpse, corpus Christi, body of Christ. And so uh, habeas corpus means that basically you have the right to your own body. You say, well, duh. Well, it basically means that <clears throat> one day I hope to talk about this more you know, personally when we're seeing each other. It means that you have the right to know why you are being detained by government officials. You can't just be plucked out of your house and taken off without knowing why. And you might say, well, what difference does it make if you know why or not? Well, if you know why, you can prepare a defense meaning that you can say, but I wasn't there that night. Or you can bring in witnesses or something like that to prove you're innocent. Anyway, uh, now Henry VIII, seventh, I'm sorry, Henry Tudor, Henry the Seventh also avoided war as well as avoiding taxation of his nobility. Now that will eventually go away. But at first, T, Henry the Seventh did not tax his nobility at first. So Roman numeral 21. Let's talk about Spain. In the year 711, <coughs> yes, 711, uh, which is, I know is the name of certain convenience stores, uh, but in the year 711, Spain was invaded and conquered by the Moors, as they were called. Actually, they were called many things. Uh, Muslims from North Africa, Saracens, infidels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> but Spain was invaded and conquered by the Moors. Um, and here's the ironic thing, though: when Spain took over, or rather, when the Moors, <clears throat> the Muslim Arabs, took over Spain, Spain, get this, never went through the Dark Ages. When the rest of Europe was stumbling around the Dark Ages, you know, burning witches. Uh, and, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things like that. 
Spain was actually being controlled by the Muslims, and um, there was lots of scholarship going on, going on, lots of reading and writing was still going on. The Muslims, the Moors, built giant cities, the cities of Cordoba. Uh, the Moors brought, uh, brought in aqueducts, baths, running water. And the Moors actually, Muslims actually, were rather tolerant to not just the Christians who lived in Spain, but also the Jews uh, who lived there. And a lot of Jews lived in Spain for a long time until the Reconquista, which we'll talk, we'll talk about in a minute, when the nice Christians kicked them out. When I, and kicked them out is a nice way of saying uh, burned them at stake. Anyway, but anyway, the point of the matter is, while uh, the rest of Europe was uh, stumbling around the Dark Ages, Spain was actually going through a revival of culture and literature and learning and architecture. I mean, and one of the great tragedies of this so-called Reconquista, which we'll talk about in a second, one of the great tragedies was when these Christians reconquered Spain, Spain, as in Reconquista. Oh, good, Burlington, I have deals coming out. Yeah. Uh, when the uh, Spanish Christians came back and eventually kicked out the Muslims, um, every all of these beautiful mosques that the Muslims had built, the, uh, the Christians raised them. Oh, Miss Horton's using big words again. Raised, R A Z E D, raised. Um, what that means is they uh, um, they level them. To raise a city or a wall or a house means you level it. And then after they leveled it on the foundation that the Muslims had built, they then built a Christian church. Um, actually, there's a couple of mosques left in Spain. There's one at Cordoba, which is quite lovely. Moorish art, architecture, and things like that. So anyway, uh, part A. After several centuries of Muslim occupation, the Spanish began the long process of the reconquista, the reconquering of its land. And here is where um, the Spanish always did this under their patron saint, St. James. St. James was one of the disciples of Jesus. If you know much about Spanish culture, within Spain there's a thing, there's a 500 mile trail called the St. James Walk. Yes, James is the patron saint of Spain. Um, St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland. St. George and St. Michael are the patron saints of England. Um, I have to think of one on the rest, but every European country has a saint. Anyway, uh, Scotland, oh yeah, the patron saint of Scotland, St. Andrew, as in St. Andrew's Cross, which is their flag. Anyway, um, so several independent kingdoms arose before the final uh, Spanish finally drove out the last of Moors from Grenada, in 1492, Grenada is an uh, outcropping um, in the extreme south of Spain. In 1492, yeah, 1492. Date should ring a bell. Yeah, the same year, right. So the two largest kingdoms of Spain at that time were Aragon under Ferdinand and Castile under Isabella. They got married, and yes, this is the Ferdinand and Isabella who banked Rolled Columbus and his expedition to the west, whose marriage united the two largest provinces of the Iberian Peninsula. Iberian Peninsula. Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula. Yes. Uh, so they were known, they being Ferdinand and Isabella, became known as Los Reyes Catalicos. And while you're searching in your Spanish dictionaries for that, it means the Catholic kings. Yeah. 
So Ferdinand and Isabel reformed into the old feudal practices and made themselves recog uh, recognized as the ruling entities of the Spanish kingdom. Their army was the strongest in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. I mean, Spain will own the 15th and most of the 16th century. Uh, during this time, it says there, Spain would allow no other religious groups to exist within its borders. 150,000 out of 200,000 Jews were forced to leave Spain. Muslims were strongly urged to convert to Christianity. These conversos, conversos were converted Jews and Muslims, were looked upon with great suspicion, and they became the target of the famous Spanish Inquisition you just underlined. The Spanish Inquisition was an attempt by the Roman Catholic Church to cleanse Spain of the infidels, Jews and Muslims, who were living there. And when I say cleanse, um, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a short story called The Pit and the Pendulum, which was about uh, the horrors of the torture chambers of the Spanish Inquisition. One name you should know and who is not listed there, Torquemada, T-O-R-Q-U-M-A-D-A. -A. He was the Grand Inquisitor. His name made people afraid. His orders would light up the night with crosses of burning Jews and Muslims uh, throughout Spain. And it was an ugly affair. But in the end, they chased the Jews and Muslims pretty much all out of Spain, for that matter. Okay, Roman number 22. Uh, by contrast, the kingdom known as the Holy Roman Empire could never fully lock down its control over what is now Germany, Italy, and Germany, Switzerland, and parts of Italy. This Holy Roman Empire was ruled, look at this, that means really, but not really, ruled by members of the Habsburg dynasty. Okay, see, there's a second dynasty, the Habsburgs, the Habsburgs. We're going to be talking about the Habsburgs all the way until 1918. So you may as well learn their names now. For a while, the Habsburgs had most property in all of Europe. They owned Austria. They owned uh, supposedly the Holy Roman Empire, made up of Germany, Italy, part of Italy and Switzerland, uh, but they also own Spain and they also own the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, they own a lot of territory at one point in time, um, but getting back to the matter hand. So um, the Holy Roman Empire was ruled by members of the Habsburg dynasty. The Habsburgs ascended into power not through wars, or, uh, you know, in conquerings or anything like that, but through strategic marriages. Yeah. Um, there were two families of Habsburgs, the Spanish Habsburgs, who of course ruled Spain, uh, and the Netherlands, and the Austria-German Habsburgs, who of course ruled Austria, and uh, much of what we now think of as Germany. Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor from 1493 to 1519 was opposed by many of the German princes who were more interested in consolidating their own kingdoms. Okay. Um, Roman rule 23. Uh, in Eastern Europe, nation making went at a much slower pace. The, major, the dominant peoples of Eastern Europe were the Slavs. We have mentioned the Slavs before, S-L-A-V-S, Slavs, taken from the old Greek and Roman word meaning slave. There were three major groups of these people. Uh, the largest group of Slavs in Europe, and you better remember this because it's going to come back again, again, again. The largest family of Slavs in Europe are the Russians. The Russians are Slavs. Okay. Not all Slavs are Russians, but Russians, and I mean real Russians. When I say real Russians, I'm talking about ethnic Russians. Not all, um, 
Not all people who live in Russia are Russian, but that's another matter. But people who are ethnically Russian are technically Slavic. Their language is Slavic to this very day. Uh, two, the second largest group of Slavs in Europe, Poles. Yeah, Polish people. Uh, oddly enough, to this very day, Poles resent Russians tremendously. The third largest group of, of Slavs in Europe are Serbs. The Russians are the Western Slavs. No, no, no. The Russians are the Eastern Slavs. The Poles are the Western Slavs. And the Serbs are the, wait for it, Southern Slavs. Do you know what the Slavic word for Southern is? You go. As in cheap car that had three cylinders and a heater, and, but uh, that was actually produced. I mean, the Yugo was actually produced in what used to be Yugoslavia, the nation called Yugoslavia. And um, yeah, it was a P a P POC, piece of crap, piece of, uh, yeah, it was a junk car. Um, but anyway, Serbs, uh, you might look on your map of the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, the Serbs have been the source of a lot of conflict over the past uh, 120 years, let's say. Okay, this area, meaning Eastern Europe, was also the domain of many conflicting religious groups, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox Christians. Remember that there were two main branches of Christianity right now, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians. Remember that the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, their leaders had excommunicated each other in, I think the year was 987 BC. But anyway, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church is, you find predominantly in Russia, you find predominantly in Greece, you find predominantly in the Middle East. <clears throat> so, um, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Muslims, Jews, uh, other pe smaller pagan groups. Um, Poland, while having a strong army for that part, or part of the medieval period, fell into disarray because of problems of infighting. Yes. Um, actually, Poland uh, was one, one of the strongest military powers in Eastern Europe. Uh, it was the Poles under John Sobieski who saved the city of Vienna in... Uh, I want to say 1687, from an invading army of Turks. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, commoners in Poland were reduced to the rank of the peasantry, and the nobles were able to elect the Polish king. How can you be a king if you get elected? Uh, yeah, and that will turn out to be really a weakening for Poland. Bohemia, I'll learn new words. Czech Bohemia, Czech Bohemia, Czech Bohemia. Um, another group of Slavs are Czechs or Bohemians. You see on your map, in fact, yours truly visited the Czech Republic in 2018. Um, yeah, was officially a part of the Holy Roman Empire. I should write that in there, Holy Roman. Of the Holy Roman Empire, but they struggle for independence from those German rulers. Hungary was the legacy of, wait for it, wait for it, the Huns. Get it? Hungary. What language is spoken in Hungary to this day? It's a language called Magyar. Yeah. Those little, little kind of things you need to know. Knowledge is power. More knowledge you have in AP Euro exam, more power. Okay, German missionaries had converted the Hungarians to Roman Catholicism. I found that to be true because I actually toured some Catholic churches in, in Budapest. Budapest is a wonderful city. Yeah, it's the easternmost western city in Europe and the westernmost eastern city in Europe. Uh, German missionaries had converted the Hungarians to Roman Catholicism. They had one strong king, Matthias Corvinus, who created a kingdom very similar to the cultural level of much of the rest of Renaissance Europe. But when he died, 
Hungary became a weakened state and would soon roll up under the rule of the Austrian Habsburgs. Uh, Russia struggled for independence from the invading Mongols for centuries before finally expelling them in the 15th century. Ivan III, also called Ivan the Great, I mean, the Russian leaders, are the most colorful leaders of Europe, see how dark it's getting in here? The most colorful leaders of all of Europe are the, uh, the Russians. Yeah, that, that they some of the people they have occupying that throne are real interesting. It could largely be because of uh, continued inbreeding in fam royal families, but we won't go there just yet. Uh, but anyway, uh, Ivan III kicked out the last of the Mongols in 1480. And we'll talk more about the Russians at another date and time. In fact, I think today is a good day to end. Here's what I'm thinking. I think we're going to finish this unit tomorrow uh, because, uh, yeah, we're going to be on page. Um, yes, we will be on. Uh, yeah, we'll finish this thing tomorrow. And uh, we'll continue. Uh, we'll have our test on this unit Monday. I have, we're going to start talking about reading documents for uh, on Friday. Yeah. So this is Mr. Horton. Uh, today is September the 9th, uh, uh, Wednesday. And uh, signing off from his home. And I uh, hope you all have a good day.